Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about moving from warheads to windmills with Timon Wallace, who is coordinator of the coalition Warheads to Windmills. You can find the website at warheadstowindmills.org. And we are going to talk about the new book as well as about the coalition. Timon Wallace, welcome back to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much, David. Great to be here. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for what you're doing. I understand you've got a book just coming out. I do. We um, we had. I, I think we might have discussed the previous uh, one of the previous versions of it a, a few years ago. We had a report um, which was a fairly thin volume, you know, looking at how to pay for a Green New Deal by getting rid of nuclear weapons and using all that money for the Green New Deal and. Um, uh, we now, well, I, I, I wanted to update it because it was from 2019 or so, and um, it got longer and longer and more and more um, intense. And so now it's a full paperback with almost a thousand footnotes and a lot of details. Well, what happened to the Green New Deal? Did it inspire actions around the world and on the local level and get wonderful, amazing, unappreciated things into Joe Biden's massive piece of legislation, despite 95% of it being cut out? Or is it a nice idea that remains to be acted on that the Congress has refused to budge for? Well, I certainly would 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 vote for the latter. In, 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 on the whole, I mean, um, it's still it's still a live uh, idea, and it has um, support in Congress from from uh, the, the the Progressive Caucus, and um, but it's not being enacted. And um, you know, one of the things I looked at in the in the new book is the Inflation Reduction Act, and it's companion the bipartisan infrastructure act and you know what what benefits those will potentially bring and as opposed to the 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 downsides of of both of those and on the whole you know my my conclusion with the inflation reduction act is that um as i'm sure other people have also reached this conclusion that you know the the overall impact could well be negative uh, overall because of of all the the loopholes in there, the the requirements to drill for oil before you can have windmills offshore, and the 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 the, the stumbling blocks in the way of of getting the the um, the tax credits that they had before, which which are now clouded with all these uh, requirements that they can't you know be sourced from China and so on, and really the 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 overall impact which we've felt. I was just saying, you know, we had um, solar panels put on our roof uh, in the last few weeks, and um, the the cost of solar panels and EVs are going to go up rather than down because of the F- Inflation Reduction Act. So it's actually causing inflation, at least on the on the climate mitigation front, because of all these restrictions. You know, we don't want to we don't want to trade with China. You know, it's all part of the. The, the war with China, really. And um, as you probably know, you know, 80% of our uh, EV batteries come from China, 85% of the solar panels in the world are made in China. So if you're trying to increase and build capacity and actually get solar panels, you know, in place, and you're trying to prevent people from buying them from the, the, the main source, you, you know, you're going to run into difficulties. Can, can we just go back to us for a second to you can't yeah. put windmills anywhere you haven't drilled for oil? This yeah, strikes just, me as comically, absurdly counterproductive. It, how did this make it through there, the brilliance of the congressional sausage making? The, the brilliance, yeah. Well, you know, as you know, there's there's Joe but- Manchin in that, in that in that sausage machine. And, um, you know, a lot of things got got into that bill which are counterproductive and, and as you say, comical. I mean, the, you know, not just the, the requirements from states to, to open up access to offshore drilling in order to get the funding for windmill, offshore, offshore wind um, turbines, but you know, there's, there's all this money for nuclear power plants, for um, uh, uh, carbon capture technologies, all the things that we have in our book as as false solutions and you know 
things that are that are well proven by now to be not the way forward. I I, I want to come back to several other points you've made and the book in general, <laughs> but uh, it's amazing to me how many people just relentlessly point me toward the the famous nuclear scientist Oliver Stone uh, on the the wisdom of going to nuclear energy when they don't seem to have a coherent argument to to <laughs> to put forward what what is happening there well it's i mean you know the our our book you know the, looks at all these these difficulties and challenges but it's also about the solutions and um you know the the number one block that we have at, are the companies you know the the nuclear weapons companies, the fossil fuel companies, but also, you know, there's such a huge vested interest in the nuclear power industry from companies that want to make a quick buck, you know, making nuclear power plants. And, and um, you know, it's high technology. It's got lots of funding from the U.S. government. It's, you know, it's it's the kind of solution that, you know, your, your, your rocket scientists like you know, Oliver Stone are, are pushing. But, you know, it's nonsense. It's, it's utter nonsense, not only from a climate point of view, but also, as we've seen in, in Ukraine, you know, these are, these are ticking time bombs in potential war zones that are, they want to put all over the world. And they're, they're the source of, of plutonium for making nuclear weapons. So it's a, it's a, the whole thing is just crazy, utterly crazy. It, it seems like one issue that ought to be separable from the madness of war, uh, and yet we know that the desire for nuclear weapons drives the desire for, for nuclear energy, and you describe U.S. infrastructure and energy policy as part of a war with China. What in the heck kind of sense does that make? Yeah, well... Um... You know, as if war with Russia is not enough. You know, we've got to have war with China. Um, I don't know. I, I again, you know, I looked a lot in the book at these dynamics um, with Russia and China and the U.S. And you know, we, the you know the the sort of obvious um, point of that you know the the countries that have the largest carbon emissions in the world that have to work together in order to resolve the climate crisis are all pointing nuclear weapons at each other, you know, and um, the, 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 as I said, the, the, the Ukraine war has highlighted how these issues are linked because it's put a complete stop to the climate agenda, having a war with Russia in Europe and the, you know, the sabotage of the pipeline and the, the huge subsidies going into fossil fuel um, to to compensate for Russian gas, you know, all these things are, I think people are waking up to that, and I hope that that will make a difference. Let's hope so. Uh, tell people where they can get the book. Well, the book is available at your local bookshop uh, and from bookshop.org, which gives um, a portion of their profits to local bookshops. If you really have to, you can go to those evil uh, sites like Amazon but there are plenty of other places to buy books and it's available anywhere you can get books. And it's called Warheads to Windmills. Exactly, Warheads to Windmills, Preventing Climate Catastrophe and Nuclear War. And we are speaking with Tim and Wallace, who is coordinator of the coalition Warheads to Windmills, which has the website warheads to windmills.org. What, what is the coalition up to working on? Well, we're just getting going actually. Um, we, um, you know, part of the um, the rationale for producing this book is to back up um, our piece of legislation that's in Congress at the moment uh, called the Norton Bill, HR 2775, which is the back, the Warheads to Windmills bill, basically. It says, you know, the U.S. should sign the Nuclear Ban Treaty, eliminate its nuclear weapons with all the other countries, and put all those wasted resources into the climate crisis and other pressing human needs. And we, you know, that's our... That's our gold standard that we're that we're trying to promote, but we've also, as I mentioned, got no no um, um, illusions that you know th th this Congress especially, but you know any any U.S. government um, is going to change their nuclear weapons policy anytime soon without a lot more pressure coming from um, civil society organizations and movements and and putting pressure, especially on the companies. 
And so that's our focus really, is uh, building a, uh, a stronger divestment and boycott movement in this country to combine with what's going on internationally, because there's a lot going on globally, not only with the nuclear ban treaty, but now with the um, uh, beginnings of a fossil fuel treaty that would that would eventually ban burning of fossil fuels and countries are coming on board with these treaties and they're putting pressure on these companies because these companies are all global you know multinational companies and so you know working in tandem with countries like Ireland for instance which make uh, having anything to do with nuclear weapons a, an offense punishable up to life in prison in Ireland um, you know, we we're trying to encourage more countries to follow that example, and we're trying to you know use that pressure that they're putting on companies to to double up the pressure in this country. So our coalition is is trying to build support for that from both climate and nuclear weapons organizations, including of course uh, World Beyond War, who's a great partner in our coalition, and Code Pink and Veterans for Peace and many other. Uh, groups that are that are very active around the country, you know, we're trying to find ways to work together uh, to build this this pressure. Are there are there co sponsors on that legislation? Yes, a small number. Um, there's 12 at the moment on the on the Norton bill. And there's another I mean, there's 42 altogether on the back from the brink resolution, which calls on the US to embrace the goals and provisions of the treaty of the nuclear ban treaty um, and there's other pieces of legislation as i mentioned the, the green new deal but there's also um, the fossil fuel i forget the title of it actually but there's a, there's a fossil fuel divestment bill which has a very small number of co-sponsors i mean these bills are are um are token you know they're they're not they're not they're not going to get passed as i said but they're a way of of identifying who are our allies in Congress and how can we uh, push them a bit further. Um, we use in the book the sort of social barometer tool to sort of identify, you know, who's who are our allies, who are our opponents and, you know, who's in between and to what extent and how we can help move, push them a little bit towards our direction. What what is a you talking about a federal U.S. congressional bill on fossil fuel divestment? What it seem I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around what that would mean when the U.S. military is the number one consumer of fossil fuels. What what would be divested? Well, the uh, I mean, I think it's as I said, these bills aren't going to get passed. <laughs> I understand, but. <laughs> But there's, a, as you know, there's a gr huge growing fossil fuel divestment movement, which has now pulled more than $40 trillion in assets out of the reach of the fossil fuel companies. And that includes, you know, lots of cities have now done that as well as, you know, faith communities and so on. But um, Maine and New York, I think, are the two states that have successfully passed legislation um, divesting from fossil fuels. And so the, the, the congressional national bill is, is modeled on those. And it's, you know, it's, it's basically, um, calling for public funds to be divested from those companies. The yeah. fossil fuel, I don't, I, as I said, I don't, I don't remember the title of it. Um, it's only got a few co-sponsors, so I'd have to look that up exactly what it says, but I mean, um, you know, it, it includes things like, you know, no more fossil fuel subsidies, as you know, that's a big, uh, another, you know, ironic thing from the Inflation Reduction Act is that it's pouring more money into fossil fuel industry and, and infrastructure for building gas pipelines and so on when we're trying to stop all that. Well, that is clear and huge. That would be wonderful for the U.S. government to stop giving subsidies to fossil fuels. Exactly. Um, I suppose that is a form of investment. Um, we've we've found in some locations, such as here in Charlottesville, Virginia, you can get the local government to divest from weapons if you combine it with divesting from fossil fuels. You're, you're divesting from the good, sacred, wonderful, humanitarian, you know, deadly weapons. <laughs> because you're tying it to and, and it's an educational process because you make the connections between the two the 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 evil fossil fuels that children don't like you know and i, I don't know <laughs> if if you i'm sure 
that it's also the case that divesting only from nuclear weapons is a little bit easier than divesting from all weapons. But what what seems to to work in your experience? Yeah, well, we're I mean, there is this growing, um, I mean, small but be, um, burgeoning movement called fossil and fissile divestment, which is trying to combine these two things. You know, this is uh, internationally, right? Um, uh, and you know we're very excited by examples that you just mentioned, where you know you you've got your city to divest from both weapons and fossil fuels. There's a few other examples around the country that have done similar things, um, and you know that's that's what we're trying to encourage. And we we did have, as you as you say, the, you know there because there's a much bigger um, movement for for fossil fuel divestment. You know it's easier to tag that along uh and and you know we've gone to student groups for instance on on campuses and said you know that, that are working on fossil fuel divestments and say you know how about adding on you know nuclear weapons to that and we've had some some interest in that so you know it's um it's something we want to work on and see how how we get how far we can get with it so so taking a step above the the u.s government at least theoretically to the united nations uh in recent weeks there have been gatherings meetings uh about fossil fuel and other uh environmental destruction and about nuclear weapons um how do you how do you think those uh yeah, so we were so um there was a group of us in New York um, at the nuclear ban treaty meeting, uh, which, you know, uh, like the fossil fuel, you know, COP28 was meeting in Dubai under the presidency of, you know, an oil magnate. And similarly, you know, the nuclear weapons meeting was in New York, you know, in the in the home of the belly of the beast. But nevertheless, you know, there were activists in both of these meetings and um, one of the things we organized as the Warheads to Windmills Coalition was a meet um, an online, you know, link up, live link up between activists in Dubai that were meeting at the COP28 and activists in New York that were meeting about the nuclear ban treaty. And we had um we had a great, I don't know if you were 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 present, but we had we had um uh, groups from we had a number of organizations that had people in both places, um, like the um International Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and the International Physicians for, for Prevention of Nuclear War, and um, some other groups, uh, as well as people that were working on the Fossil Fuel Treaty in Dubai, and those working on, you know, ICANN. We had the the new Executive Director of ICANN, Melissa Park, and so we had this, um, um, uh, you know, exchange of of, of um, perspectives and um you know sharing of, of learnings and so on from the two meetings um and that was that was quite exciting and as i said uh you know we're trying to we're trying to encourage countries that have signed the nuclear ban treaty for instance to take stronger uh, measures to to put pressure on the companies like ireland has and so that was a big part of our goal in in new york was to um, we, you know, we delivered a paper to the to the um, meeting and spoke to it, and tried to lobby the countries there um, about um, you know strengthening their national implementation of the treaty. So we were working on that. The fossil fuel treaty people, um, you know, they went into the COP twenty eight with two countries um, supporting the fossil fuel treaty idea. Um, both of them tiny islands in the Pacific, which who will disappear completely with climate change. But they came out of the meeting uh, at the end of the two weeks with 12 countries in support, including some bigger ones like Colombia. So they were quite excited about that progress. There's still a long way to go. But, um, you know, if we can combine these, these um, you know, global efforts for really putting in into law, you know, these what has to happen to save you know humanity from these two existential threats then we can we can we can work you know down the down the scale to build support for those are we are we reaching a point at which there are corporations that see more advantage in steering clear of nuclear weapons uh and more disadvantage in facing criminal penalties in places like ireland if they if they stay involved in in, in nuclear weapons because they work 
multinationally and they have to work in the countries that uh, have sane uh, nuclear weapons policies? Well, we're 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 hoping that that's happening. It's hard it's hard to to really pin that down. But you know, we've had uh, two nuclear weapons companies in Europe uh, that have pulled out of the nuclear weapons business in the last couple of years, and we you know we don't know for sure the reasons. But um, Serco, which is a British company that was involved in the in the atomic weapons establishment in in the, in England pulled out and they did say in their sort of annual report or whatever, I mean, it's in writing that they've decided that um, it's not in their interest to, to be involved in the nuclear weapons business. So that's exciting. Yeah. Um, we had a, we had a, an earlier example with Honeywell, which was not what we intended, but we, we started a campaign about five years ago to get people to refuse to buy their thermostats from Honeywell and to write to the company and we had we had thousands of people doing that across the country, um, and you know our our local Quaker meeting here in Massachusetts, for instance, had this lively um, email exchange with with one of the vice presidents of Honeywell, who originally wrote and said, "Well, we don't we don't make nuclear weapons," <laughs> and they we, you know they wrote back and said, "Well, actually, you do." And you know this went on, and the the interesting thing about it is that Honeywell then sold their thermostat division. We wanted them to sell their nuclear weapons division, <laughs> but instead they they decided to hold on to the nuclear weapons and get rid of their thermostats so that they couldn't be, um, you know, subject to this kind of um, um, humiliation or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's you know it's it's um it's not a straight line, but you know the more the more we can get um, countries and well and and you know cities and so on to be to be putting this pressure on the companies they don't like it we know that for sure and we've had lots of examples you know going back through history of of um boycotts and and divestment campaigns you know having a real impact on these companies so for sure we're hoping, we're hoping okay. that it will that it will yield some results it, it, because it seems like maybe this, the country signing and ratifying the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons has reached a bit of a plateau. It's it's harder to get to get new ones. Um, so that's obviously has to remain one strategy. But getting the ones that have ratified to take right. steps to make it even to make to put pressure on the corporations may be an easier push. I don't know. Well, it's not one or the other. I mean, we're still. You know, we got two huge countries just about to come on board in the next year, Brazil and Indonesia, which will be pretty big. You know, they're 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 important countries globally and, and they have a lot of of U.S. companies also. <laughs> yes. So, you know, that that kind of thing is is what we're looking for. And of course, you know, in Europe, um, you know, it's just it's it's um, the pressure is building hugely in Europe for for a change within the NATO countries. And. You know, the first country that that breaks ranks and signs the treaty will open a floodgate. I think uh, Germany has a coalition government that's supposedly committed to signing the treaty. So does Spain, uh, Iceland. The you know the the prime minister of Iceland and almost her entire parliament supports signing the treaty, uh, as does Finland. Um, you know, I mean, Finland and Sweden just joined the NATO, as you know, but they're still very strongly anti-nuclear. And so, you know, there's pressure in Belgium and the Netherlands um, and even in Italy. Uh, so, you know, so at some point that's going to crack and that's going to be a big, a big shift because, the, you know, the U.S. part of their whole excuse for having to have nuclear weapons is, well, our, you know, our NATO allies, you know, need us to have these weapons. And, you know, it's for them, which is obviously rubbish. <laughs> yes, uh, quite obviously. Um, <laughs> we we got not too many minutes left, Tim and okay. Wallace. Uh, it, it, this also seems like a moment of a lot of activism about particular wars that right. risk developing into nuclear war. How do you how do you work with all of the energy and excitement that people have in opposing one or in some cases two or three? particular wars uh and and making the need for a for an overall shift to to sustainable peaceful policies uh part of the demand well that's a great question um 
as you know, you know, the, the Ukraine war, which I spent a lot of time discussing in the book, um, has not been easy on the on on peace movements in general, because, you know, there's just been this outburst of support for Ukraine and outrage at Russia and so on. And it's skewed a lot of thinking. And I think in a way the Gaza bombardment going on now is helping to redress that balance a bit, you know, because people are, as you say, you know, there's, there's a lot of activism on the campuses and so on, and people are on the streets and, um, you know, I think that helps people to realize, you know, like war is pretty stupid and, and as well as being, you know, hugely destructive and evil. And, um, you know, I hope that that will, that will carry over a bit to Ukraine and to the, to the bigger thinking about like, do we really want to have a war with China? I mean, you know, there's just some crazy, crazy, I, you know, things going on out there and people are, are rising up, um, at the moment, and let's hope that 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 will that will lead on to bigger, bigger um, questioning of the whole system. And and yet it seems that the Ukraine war is the war that many experts think have pushed us closer than ever before to nuclear war and nuclear apocalypse for most life on the planet. Uh, yeah. And you would think that that if we could succeed in educating people about what that means then it wouldn't matter how much they were falling for the war propaganda on one side of a war and cheering for one side of a war. It would matter more than that yeah. to avoid exterminating life on earth. Yeah, well, that's our task. You know, we've got to, we've got to educate people about that. And um, as you mentioned, you know, the propaganda is out there and it's pretty strong. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's hard, it's hard to believe sometimes what people will fall for um, in this age of Trump and everything else, you know, <laughs> but um, we're, we're up against some really big challenges for sure. And of course, you, as you mentioned, you know, the, the, the nuclear danger in Ukraine is still there for sure. But so is with, with Israel, you know, and, um, you know, the only country in that region with nuclear weapons and, um, you know, if things don't go their way, uh, who knows, you know. It's, yeah, it's, we have we have we have a lot to to work on. <laughs> well, thank you for everything you've been working on thus far, and I'm glad you're going to keep doing it. Uh, the book is called Warheads to Windmills, and the website is Warheads to Windmills org. We've been speaking with Tim and Wallace. Tim and thank you very very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you so much. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.